In the beginning, there was nothing. Pure potential, pure consciousness, pure mind. This was Purusha. Then came Prakriti, energy, nature. She brought Purusha to life. The entire universe came into being and the earth came into being, the first animals. Then Purusha became Pashupati, lord of the beasts. He watched over the world with tenderness and realized that all creatures would suffer, endure pain and death. In compassion, he taught them the art of yoga. The first to hear this teaching was the snake Patanjali and it was he who brought yoga to all mankind. They say that who heard him best was the serpent round his neck, Karkotaka or Patanjali and therefore Patanjali is visualized as a serpent because he sits next to Shiva and he heard every whisper and every breath so he knows it better than others and he shared it with the world. Yoga is more than anything else it's a practice it's a discipline it is your connection with something that is eternal you can call it consciousness it is that part of you that is untouched by anything. So yoga for me as far as I understand is to unite the body with the mind and taking body and mind together to be in par with the eternal evergreen state of this self. Today yoga is practiced by millions of people around the world. From the studios and gyms of America to the halls of culture in China Yoga has become one of the world's favorite holistic health practices. But what really is yoga? Where did it come from? What does its practice do for your body and your mind? How did yoga spread around the world? Can yoga bring you into balance with your deepest self and nature? Indian thought has always celebrated imagination, which is manam, the mind. So we are called Manava, animals who can imagine. Yoga enables our imagination to celebrate and understand nature in her totality. That's the point of yoga. The human animal has always tried to control nature and tried to control his environment. Somewhere in India's long history, the control of nature turned inwards and became about the control of the body and the mind. This inner journey became what we know of as yoga. For billions of years, nature has been around and suddenly humans come about. And what makes humans special? We are capable of imagination. This imagination is Purusha and Prakriti is nature and this conversation between the two is the birth of creation. And so we are always in conflict with nature which nature says you are just another animal and I am saying no I am special. No. And so my fear starts crumpling my mind. I refuse to accept reality and this is the birth of Aham. Me, I am important. Yoga is the opposite, unraveling of it. You start opening it. And when it completely opens up, no. when it reaches that state, it sees the world as it is, not the way I see it. The origins of yoga are shrouded in mystery and mythology. We find many clues in the practices of Himalayan shamans, as can still be seen in Tibet and Nepal today, where the Lord of the Beasts is still revered. 
A practice like yoga was known in the Indus Valley civilization around 2500 BC. You see these seals which show images of people doing, for example, Namaste. Now, did they use the word Namaste or was this gesture popular even then? You have people sitting in a yogic, what is called a Bhadrasana, what is late, we now call the throne position. By the 5th century BC, yoga was becoming well known and begun to appear in Vedic scripture. The word yoga is a Sanskrit word. It uh, comes from the root yuja, which basically means to bind, to align, to hold. So it's about falling in place at the right time and everything works out for you, which is synthesis really. These techniques of mental control were becoming known to all religions and philosophies practiced at that time, including Buddhism and Jainism. By the second century BC, yoga had evolved into an independent philosophy and practice and was codified into a scripture known as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Atta yoga nushasanam yoga ha chitta vritti nirodhaha tada Visualize thousands and thousands of sages talking about this. One of them happens to be no Sanskrit. One of them happens to be literate and is eager to write it down. So Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is one document. It's not the whole wisdom. It's written as a sutra. Sutra means a seed which has to be put into your mind and, into plant and transform into a plant. The purpose of yoga is to still the mind stuff and unite the basic human consciousness with its original state of complete consciousness or purusha. It then goes on to say that the human being is made up of five layers or koshas that act in unison. The five koshas are layers, energy, Prana, which is the life force energy, moves between all of them and always keeps them connected. You talk of the sheaths. The Taitri Upanishad has a fascinating theory. They talk of the five sheaths, the Pancha Kosha, the Annamaya Kosha, which is our physical body, the Pranamaya Kosha, which is our astral body, the Manomaya Kosha, which is our mental body, the Vijnanamaya Kosha, which is our higher overmind, and finally, the Anandamaya Gosha, the blissful sheath. So we have to cross over the bridge on the physiological body, from the physical body to mental body. Then using the mental body, we have to understand, discriminate each and every part. Then naturally, you find that each and every cell in the system has its own intelligence, has its own memory, so that the, the cells can take of the body for me to think of God, the higher level of spiritual life. To align the koshas together, Patanjali prescribed a system called Ashtanga, or the eight-limbed path. The first five parts are the, the discipline part of it, the doing part of it. Uh, the last three parts uh, of the eight are internal. They are the outcome of practicing the five. So Yama and Niyama are the first two. Yama refers to how you behave with internally, how you experience the world, how you conduct yourself. Niyama are rules, Niyam means a rule or a discipline of uh, physically living, how you behave in conduct with yourself and with the world around you. Then you come to asana, which is your connection with your own physical body. Then you come with pranayama uh, and the whole purpose of asana is to prepare the body for pranayama so that when you breathe, that prana can circulate completely, access different parts of your body. And then you come to pratyahara, which is restraint. Pratyahara actually means to withdraw the senses, but it's not, it doesn't mean detachment or to go into a mountain. It means to not identify unnecessarily, not be too attached to something, not be too detached from anything either. So balance, the best word is balance. And then you come to dharana, dhyana and samadhi, which are called the antarangas. They are the internal limbs of yoga because um, 
If you practice the first five limbs, then they are the outcome. Your ability to focus, your ability to meditate on something, and your ability to access uh, union with true self, with that consciousness, which is what Samadhi is. So yoga is bringing the Ashtanga together in order to bring the koshas together, in order to achieve Samadhi. So yoga is both the practice and it is the goal. By the early part of the first millennium, Yoga had become integrated into mainstream Buddhism, Jainism and what later became known as Hinduism with the writing of the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita describes four yogas that anyone could practice in life. There is the Jnana Yoga, which is the way of knowledge, the way of discriminative knowledge, of being able to see what is real and what is unreal. Another way is the Bhakti Yoga. Now the Bhakti Yoga is uh, the yoga of devotion. If the Jnana Yoga is the way of wisdom, the Bhakti Yoga is the way of devotion, the way of love. The third path of yoga is what might be called the Karma Yoga, the way of the hands, of action. But not any action. Action dedicated to the divine. And then the fourth, and in some ways the most fascinating path, is what is known as the Raj Yoga the royal road, and that is, that involves the breathing practices, the Hatha Yoga, what, what people in the West look upon as yoga, which are the physical exercises, are only one small part of the Raj Yoga. But I would say these are the four major paths. You can do one or two or three or four, you can combine in whatever way you like, but you have to make a conscious effort if you want to grow spiritually. I don't think it happens automatically. Once in Kailash, Shiva was teaching Parvati the secrets of yoga. Together they danced the cosmic dance. A fish who had swallowed a fisherman came upon them by chance and stopped to watch. As Shiva revealed the secrets of yoga to Parvati, the man inside the fish also listened carefully. When Shiva realized they were not alone, he was pleased and continued to teach the fish. He named the man Matsendranath after the fish he was in. Shiva then sent him back to teach the world yoga. And this is how Hatha Yoga came into being. Now why fish? Because fish is movement. It's not stillness. He comes to Kailas, which is stillness, and the fish, which is all about movement, tells the world. So Matsya, as a means, it means life, it means movement, and he discovers the secret of stillness. He becomes the Nath. He shares it with the world. In the 12th century, a monastic group arose called the Nats that codified the practice of yoga into a training manual and methodology for monks called Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga has been misinterpreted certainly to a very great extent as physical yoga. But Hatha means willpower. So mind is considered as the king, therefore they were Raja Yoga came, control of mind. Whereas willpower is stronger than mind. Yogis were encouraged to become celibate and detached from the world. And over 84 asanas were developed to tune the yogi into a higher state of physical and mental consciousness. Very essence of yoga, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. When the chitta vrittis of the chitta or the waves of the thoughts or waves of the consciousness is restrained, there is stability. So while practicing the asanas in a spiritual line, even Patanjali says, stability of the mind will come by the practice of asanas because there is no other movement except that position, posture. By that, you experience the state of infinity. These postures were first detailed in the 15th century through a book called the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. 
What this did was move yoga away from the lives of ordinary people and into secret schools and systems across India. You see these two schools emerging. One which says yoga is about withdrawing from the world, withdrawing from prakriti, rejecting prakriti. And this whole notion of purification by not connecting with the world. So I isolate myself completely. And the other tradition, which is the Gorakh tradition, which is the tradition of yoga, which is communicating with the world, talking to the world. By the time the British colonized India from the 18th century onwards, yogis were seen as eccentric, dangerous madmen who lived at the edge of society and could do all kinds of magic and contortions. Indian Maharajas and the British rulers would regularly organize whimsical demonstrations of yogis and magicians, and India became known as the exotic land of mystical and magical powers. When the Europeans came to India, they were surprised by the exotic. They wanted to understand this exotic creature called India. And that's when the 18th century, this exotic India manifests itself to satisfy the gaze of the master. By the end of the 19th century, the word yoga had started to become well known in Europe and America through the work of the theosophists and the arrival of Swami Vivekananda. He taught Americans the ideas behind Raja Yoga and his little book became a Bible to all spiritual seekers and mystics in that period. In India, the Maharaja of Mysore was a great patron of yoga. His teacher was the legendary Krishna Macharya. Iyengar was his star student and gave most of the demonstration popularizing Hatha Yoga in Mysore and across India. In 1952, Yehudi Menuhin and Iyengar became good friends and he arranged for Iyengar to demonstrate yoga in London, Zurich, Paris and New York's Carnegie Hall. Audiences were amazed at Iyengar's yoga and by 1966 he had published his first book called Light on Yoga. In the next few years, this became the Bible of the new yoga movement spreading around the world. The West, because of the Greek influence, has always celebrated the body. It has celebrated exercise. And suddenly you see these people who are also talking about the body, but in the complete opposite way. There's no conquest. In fact, it's the opposite of conquest, killing the urge to conquer. It just says, look inside. Calm down. Life is not so terrible. Sit down. Breathe. Your body has the answer, your breath has the answer, your mind has the answer. These are conversations that didn't happen before and these executives are like, this is like mana from heaven. I'm very happy that yoga which, had, which was forgotten entirely. Now, like mushrooms, it has come everywhere. And at least they have made a beginning. And I'm sure when a beginning has been made, they, after touching the grass, probably they may they settle and they settle as, as time goes by. Yoga has a profound effect on the human mind and body, and its healing powers have been known for over 2,000 years. It works not only on the joints, but also on the endocrine system, helping glands to function properly. The effects on the brain are also well documented. Today, scientists at India's Nimhans are exploring the science of yoga and its effect on the brain. This is one of the areas which have been recognized way back in our, the motto that alternative medicine, what we call as an alternative medicine to be part of neurosciences and mental health. Apart from that, we also have an advanced center for yoga, which is about five years old. We have examined the yoga effects on the brain using MRI there are some areas of the brain which get better following yoga and in the, there are some situations wherein when chanting of OM happens there are areas of the brain which are changed for the betterment of the individual. 
when you keep chanting om or any other thing you read quran you read the bible when you keep reading it loud you start resonating in your ears from the ears the electrical activity comes down and then it starts ascending up okay as it ascends up it causes a calming of it how yoga could help us in the management of patients for example in mental health disorders what we talked about as the stress the stress is one of the important area which is now causing a lot of problem in the global scenario yoga is seen as a valid complementary practice to traditional medicine and is being recommended by doctors in india and around the world mainstream medicine Uh, sends uh, people to us for rehabilitation uh, for for what they call stress and therefore cannot put a finger on it beyond that or even lifestyle diseases which don't have a cure really they they so um i think people want to uh, choose yoga which gives them they come and uh, people will say that makes me feel good that makes me feel calm so yoga without soma there is no psycho without psycho there is no soma they go together if you ask the word very chitta vritti nirodha chitta is in the body body is a form of chitta a gross form of chitta so psychosomatic science was used by patanjali long long ago without using the word psychosomatic science so this contact of the body which is no skeletal body skeletal body in contact with the circulatory system circulatory system is connected to the nervous system when the nervous system is connected which is known as a indirect unconscious mind so when the nerves are strengthened positive brain comes to them positive thinking will come today over 20 million people practice yoga of some kind in america alone and the phenomenon is spreading worldwide in india many advanced teaching and research institutions provide students and wellness seekers with access to some of the world's best teachers and practices in yoga i think yoga is something which is beyond a culture or a nation as a country with a very rich and one of the richest uh heritages in the world it is our responsibility to nurture it suddenly people are looking inwards the lotus has unfurled a little bit so you're feeling a little bit more calmer happier seeing there's a value in the body talks to the mind the breath talks to the mind but come on let's talk to the mind the mind is still tight and it's still aggressive and the simplest example of it is this obsession with wanting to own yoga having read lots of books on yoga having practiced yoga as far as my understanding goes yoga is one as people call god in different names but he is one yoga is one but as it branches of the trunk so different people give it different names yoga is a universal practice that brings you into balance and harmony with your life no matter what religion or ethnicity you belong to awareness and attention when they come together there is no movement of intelligence there is no movement of uh, mind so there is a state where i my body my mind my breath has finds no differences at all i'm living uh, even now though i'm talking to you even my warmth of my toe i can feel how much warm it is at that time what happens there is no movement there is no thought is completely a state of forgetfulness of body and mind but to be one with the cosmos cosmic energy and the individual energy meeting together Shine